So hi and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings and we'll begin with a new text today. So we just finished with uh, Bell Hooks' essay Understanding Patriarchy. So the work we'll start off with today is Donna Haraway's a very famous um, um, sort of book come long essay called The Cyborg Manifesto uh, and that's the title of the work and it's got a subtitle as well which is Science, Technology and Socialist Feminism in the Late 20th Century. So. At the very beginning, we know that this is historicized in the late 20th century, capitalist uh, technocratic politics, and it talks about the possibilities of socialist feminism, the possibilities of socialist feminism engaging with science and technology in late 20th century capitalism, which is the setting, the, the historical setting out of which the Cyber Manifesto is written. So, it's a very famous, it's one of the seminal works really on uh, modern feminist writings, not least because it offers us uh, an alternative identity of the cyborg. So the cyborg is an alternative identity, as a possible identity. It's something which is theorized and, and historicized and offered by Haraway in this particular essay. And it's one of these books, one of those books actually, which are a very useful example of the mix between feminism, postmodernism, postcolonialism, uh, and uh, posthumanism, because you know all, they all come together in different combinations in terms of offering the idea of the cyborg, the identity of the cyborg as an identity marker in postmodern politics. So what is a cyborg? So we begin with the very beginning and the title of the chapter, the, the first section of the essay is an ironic dream of a common language for women in the integrated circuit. Now the very title, we should spend some, a little bit of time on the title because the word, the phrase ironic dream is a very important uh, phrase because irony becomes a very important uh, category uh, in postmodernism, a very important ontological category, a very important functional category in postmodernism because irony, what is irony? Irony is the ability uh, to say something and mean something else. So irony has a degree of uh, semantic slipperiness. It, it is slippery uh, in terms of the meanings it can take up. Uh, so irony is about the process in which meanings become, you know, made, unmade and remade and uh, different combinations. So irony becomes a very important category, a very important function that way. So the ironic dream is a very uh, interesting way to describe a certain kind of a utopian uh, aspiration for a common language for women in the integrated circuit. So what is the ironic dream all about? So this essay is an effort to build an ironic political myth faithful to feminism, socialism and materialism. Right now, the ironic political myth which is faithful. So again, look at the uh, supposedly opposite categories over here, irony and faithfulness. Right, so you know we, we don't normally associate irony with faithfulness, irony with authenticity, but over here these oppositional categories become very important in a postmodern uh, perspective. So faithful to feminism, socialism, and materialism, perhaps more faithful as blasphemy as faithful than as reverent worship and identification. Now very quickly uh, it moves into a provocative territory, as you can see, uh, and Haraway spends some time talking about blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Now before we move on, let's take a look at, uh, let's discuss the idea of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? What is the ont ontological definition or a functional uh, marker for blasphemy? How can you be, a, you know, how can you blasphemize something? Now, a blasphemy can only occur if a certain category is over-appropriated, hyper-appropriated and then defamiliarized and then distorted. So distortion can only take place uh, after complete and absolute appropriation. So blasphemy requires knowledge. Blasphemy requires an appropriation. Blasphemy requires a certain degree of understanding. So you understand something completely and then you deform it, you defamiliarize it, you distort it. But that distortion, that defamiliarization can only take place uh, if you're able to understand it fully. So blasphemy is not just uh, uh, an activity which is ontological in quality, it's also an epistemic activity. It, it, it happens at a level of knowledge. You deform knowledge, you distort knowledge after you've understood and grasped the entire original knowledge. So blasphemy becomes uh, a bit of a faithful tribute because in order to be blasphemous, you should be able to understand it fully and then distort it. So that's the, the category, that's the uh, definition that Haraway is taking away here. So blasphemy has always seemed to require taking things very seriously. So in order to you know, joke about it, in order to deform it, defamiliarize something, you need to be able to take it very, very seriously at first uh, and then understand it completely and then obviously play with it in this different semantic possibilities. So I know no better stance to adopt from within the secular religious 
uh, evangelical traditions of United States politics, including the politics of socialist feminism. Uh, so blasphemy becomes a very important uh, category, a very important instrument of politics, according to Haraway. And she's actually celebrating blasphemy as, uh, as a category, as a function. And she's saying, you know, this is a very important function because uh, it is the best stance to take within the secular, religious, evangelical traditions of the United States, including the politics of socialist feminism. So socialist feminism in modern United States must take up blasphemy quite seriously because blasphemy is a very serious representation of something, right? So, you know, at the very outset of the book, we understand that this is going to be a very provocative book. And it's a book about blasphemy, it's a book, a book about appropriation, ironic appropriation, etc. So blasphemy protects one from the moral majority within while still insisting on the need for community. Blasphemy is not apostasy. Now what is apostasy? Apostasy is a complete renunciation of faith. It's like giving up of faith. It's like a complete liquidation of faith. Uh, so apostasy is an absolute absence of faith. Whereas blasphemy is a very, very complex presence of faith. Uh, and anti-faith. It's a very complex play between faith and anti-faith, between tribute and parody, between uh, you know, faithfulness and irreverence. So you know, blasphemy becomes a very complex cognitive category, a very complex ontological category, etc. So apostasy is an easier category to define. It's, it's an absolute absence of something. Right. Now, how does irony feature over here? How does irony come into being? Uh, interestingly, when you would look at blasphemy as, a, as, a, as an instrument uh, of subversion, as an instrument of representation in a postmodern world of socialist feminism, irony is about contradictions that do not resolve into larger wholes, even dialectically, about the tension of holding incompatible things together because both are all unnecessary and true. Now, look at the the run of opposites over here, the uh, run of an ontological opposites. It's about, uh, you know, uh, the whole idea of compatibility and fractured, the whole idea of tensions uh, and togetherness. So all these come into being with irony, and irony becomes a very important vehicle, linguistic vehicle, uh, semantic vehicle, ontological vehicle for this kind of complex representation. So what is irony about? Irony is about contradictions, the contradictions which never will dissolve into unity which never really aspire uh, for a unity, and that becomes a very important category. The aspiration is absent. Uh, there's no aspiration for unity. There's no intention for unity uh, when it comes to irony. It's about contradictions that do not resolve into larger wholes, even dialectically, about the tension of holding incompatible things together because both are all unnecessary and true. So, there is a degree of simultaneity, there's a degree of ambivalence about irony, which makes it a very complex cognitive function. It's about holding opposites together because both are equally true and equally necessary and equally present at any given point of time. And that equal presence, that, that the simultaneity becomes a very important condition for irony to take place. So irony is about humor and serious play. Again, look at the um, ontological opposites which run away. It's about humor and serious play. And so you know, it just comes across as an oxymoron, serious play, but it's actually something of a very important activity in postmodernism because play becomes a very important activity in a postmodern perspective because play can open up uh, possibilities, play can open up different kind of configurations which then can be taken over and can become subversive in quality, can become um, anti totalitarian in quality, etc. So, serious play becomes a very important function in postmodernism, and irony is about humor and serious play. It's about cracking up of possibilities. It's like opening up and teasing up of possibilities uh, in any particular ontological condition. It's also a rhetorical strategy and a political method, one I would like to see more honored within socialist feminism. So at the very outset, we can see that what Haraway is suggesting is that irony should be seen as a rhetorical strategy and a political method. So it should not be limited to a language game. It should not be limited to a rhetorical play of words, etc. It should also be taken over. It should also be appropriated as a political strategy, as a political method. And Haraway is saying that, you know, I, I would like to see irony more often feature uh, in uh, I mean, socialist feminism in the world we live in today. Uh, at the center of my ironic faith is my blasphemy, is an image of the cyborg. So, a cyborg is something uh, which is situated right at the heart of irony, right at the heart of blasphemy in the postmodern world. Now, it's very important that we historicize the world that Haraway is describing. We, the world that she's talking about is a world of uh, uh, great scientific progress, technological innovations, uh, capitalist technology, etc. And in this particular world, this is a historical setting, this is a material setting out of which the cyborg is produced. And uh, 
out of which it emerges as a phenomenon, as a myth, as a possibility. Now that possibility uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is, is invested with irony, is invested with blasphemy, uh, and that blasphemy and irony carries, or it, you know, embodies the image of the cyborg. The, cy the image of cyborg becomes a very important center for that kind of an ironic activity. Now, what is a cyborg, and or rather, who is a cyborg? Uh, so we find that what Haraway is offering as a definition over here is again a run of opposites. Uh, so he, he, he she gives an example of a cyborg as some kind of an organism which is an assemblage of man and machine, which does away with distinctions of gender, does away with distinctions between organic and inorganic, which does away with distinctions between rationality and irrationality, etc. So in other words, uh, it's very, very anti-dualistic in quality. It's something which uh, accommodates opposites, uh, something which uh, celebrates opposites in a very postmodernist sense. So cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality, as was a creature of fiction. So again, look at the run of opposites over here. It's a creation of reality as well as a fiction, it's a creation of materiality as well as fantasy, and that's something which uh, keeps coming up uh, in the cyborg politics that Haraway is describing. Social reality is lived uh, social relations. Our most important uh, political construction, a world changing fiction, the internalization, the, sorry, the, inter, inter, uh, yeah, the international women's movements have constructed women's experience as well as uncovered or discovered this crucial collective object. This experience is fiction and a fact of the most crucial political kind. Liberation rests on the construction of the consciousness, the imaginative apprehension of oppression and so of possibility. The cyborg is a matter of fiction and lived experience that changes what counts as woman's experience in the late 20th century. Now, cyborg becomes a very important signifier, according to Haraway, of the changing conditions of women's experiences in the 21st and late 20th century and obviously anticipating the 21st century. So this is a struggle over life and death. But the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. So let's just come to this final sentence that Haraway is uh, uh, describing. So the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. So what we're saying, what is suggested over here is, so the entire uh, borderline between you know, lived reality and fantasy, between the virtual and the real, the blurry. Uh, with the postmodern times, and what we have is an example of hyper reality. So, hyper reality becomes a phenomenon in the postmodern times, and cyborg becomes uh, in that hyper real universe uh, a, a body which is fictional as well as material, a body which is fantastic as well as real. And obviously, this conflation of fantasy and reality, of fictionality and materiality, uh, makes a cyborg a political movement, a political uh, persona uh, in a certain sense. And especially, and not least, when the boundary between science fiction and social reality becomes an optical illusion, it's just a shallow illusion, optical illusion, not even an existential confusion, an optical illusion. So the, the shallowness of the illusion is something which is uh, foregrounded. Uh, you know, it's a very superficial kind of illusion that is foregrounded by Haraway uh, in this particular context. Now, contemporary science fiction is full of cyborgs, creatures simultaneously animal and machine who populate worlds uh, ambiguously natural and crafted. So again, look at the run of opposites that are happening over here. So creatures uh, which, who are simultaneously animal and machine, who, you know, they, they are creatures who are natural and crafted. Modern machine is also full of cyborgs, of couplings between organism and machine, each conceived as coded devices in an intimacy and with a power that were not generated in the history of sexuality. Uh, so intimacy becomes a very important condition in, in the cyborg um, politics, uh, and, and Haraway is saying that you know if you look at science fiction, if you look at modern medicine, uh, it's full of cyborgs. Uh, so modern medical practices contain examples, many several examples of um, phenomena where the man and machine are simultaneously enmeshed with each other. So think of uh, something like a heart transplant. Think of something like a pacemaker, uh, something of an artificial uh, you know ventilator which is in, you know, incorporated in the particular body in order to make the body alive. So, so that becomes, those examples become very important uh, pointers uh, to the emergence of cyborg in modern medicine. So how modern medicine becomes increasingly uh, an entanglement uh, of organism and machine. And we, it becomes a very asymmetric entanglement because we don't quite know uh, to what extent it is purely organic and to what extent it becomes machinic in quality. Now, this kind of an intimacy and this kind of a powerful intimacy were unprecedented, was never generated before in the history of sexuality. Cyborg sex restores some of the lovely replicate baroque of ferns and invertebrates, 
uh, subbulk replication is uncoupled from organic reproduction. Modern uh, production seems like a dream of cyborg, um, uh, you know, uh, colonization work, a dream that makes a nightmare of Taylorism seem idyllic. A modern war is a cyborg OJ coded by C3I, command, control and communication intelligence, an 84 billion item in 1984's US defense budget. Now, what she's saying over here is, in, when we move in the realm of the cyborg, we move away from a reproduction and the movement to replication. Again, the materiality of the process is something which is highlighted. It's not really an organic process, it's not really a reproduction in an organic sense, but it becomes replication which is uncoupled from organic reproduction. And then of course, uh, she talks about modern production which becomes more uh, distributive in quality rather than sequential in quality. An example of Taylorism uh, over here is quite significant because Taylorism and Fordism were the two main production principles of early 20th century. So, you know, obviously Taylor and Ford, uh, Henry Ford, uh, they were the big industries of, you know, Western Europe and then America incorporated you know, that kind of capitalist logical production and um, consumption. But it was more of a sequential order of production and consumption, whereas uh, the modern uh, production principle is more distributive, uh, it's more, uh, and it's got more velocity about it and that makes look, makes the nightmare of Taylorism look idyllic in quality. It looks like it's some kind of pastoral past uh, compared to the modern modes of production in which a cyborg is invested. And then there's reference to modern war which becomes an OG, a cyborg OG. And obviously, uh, you know, Haraway seems to anticipate much of modern combat techniques, uh, especially when it comes to drone warfare and you know, drone military uh, violence because drones become very important examples of cyborgs. So machines which will fight the wars for the humans um, and again machines which are controlled by the humans, machines which have intelligence which are governed by humans but at the same time they seem to transgress humans as well. So transgression becomes a very important uh, activity in cyborg politics as we'll see in, uh, in a short while. Now C3I becomes a very important um, you know very important category of the, of the cyborg and what is C3I? Command, control, communication, intelligence. Now that becomes a very important category of knowledge, uh, military intelligence as well as security system in modern America and Haraway says it becomes, it, it requires and demands an 84 billion item uh, budget in 1984's US defense budget. So US defense budget becomes a very important point up to the emergence of this kind of a cyborg warfare, this kind of a drone warfare where command, control and communication intelligence become uh, and becomes a very important factor in this kind of a system of combat. Now just to, I, I wind up with this point, but then just conclude the first lecture on the cyborg manifesto. What Harvey is saying is we're living in a condition which is very quickly becoming a very interesting entanglement with a man and machine, where I don't quite know where the boundary of the organic ends and the boundary of the inorganic or machine begins, uh, because that boundary is constantly you know, blurring away. Uh, and different configurations uh, and that, that in itself becomes a very, very important activity which can become subversive in quality. But then also let's rem you know, remember the fact that postmodernism uh, or the cyborg uh, embodiment that Haraway is talking about uh, is not necessarily subversive all the time. So it can become subversive, it can become complicit, it can become a very important confusion between subversion and between being complicit. And that, that confusion, that ambivalence is something which is constantly present uh, in a cyborg identity politics as described by Harley. Uh, to, so to that extent, the cyborg is not a predictable organism. It becomes a very unpredictable phenomena, a very unpredictable process of becoming, unbecoming and rebecoming, which is what uh, Harley is talking about throughout this manifesto. But then she would say in the end, how that becomes a very, uh, it becomes a more agentic activity to a certain extent rather than being deified uh, as a goddess, rather than being deified as a docile woman, as a virtuous woman. So the cyborg becomes an agentic activity of, you know, it can become anarchic and can become violent. Uh, it re will require a degree of philosophy about it. But at the same time, because it's blurring away all the borderlines which had historically informed European Enlightenment, it becomes an act of subversion uh, at different micro levels of existence and operation. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this text in the lectures to come. And, and this is um, Donna Haraway's Cyber Manifesto, which is the second text we are doing in this particular course in feminist writings. Uh, so thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.